All right, good morning everyone and welcome to the University of Maine at Farmington 16th Annual Supreme Court Preview and Review Constitution Day Talk. I must say it is so nice to finally be able to welcome the public back to this year's edition after a brief pandemic hiatus. To begin, my name is Seth Maine and I'm a, currently a senior studying political science. I am honored today to introduce today's speaker, UMF's very own political science professor, Dr. Jim Melcher. Over the course of my studies here at UMF, I've had the privilege to take many courses with Dr. Melcher, including constitutional law and civil liberties. Do, uh, Dr. Melcher's enthusiasm, passion, and expertise in the field of political science is very evident in every lecture he gives and every conversation you have with him. His love for politics stems from his childhood spent in one of the United States' most politically active cities, Madison, Wisconsin. Dr. Melcher eventually attended the University of Wisconsin-Madison for his undergraduate degree and received his doctorate at the prestigious University of Minnesota under the tutelage of one of the all-time great political scientists, Frank Soroff. In 1999, the University of Maine at Farmington was fortunate to have Dr. Melcher accept a position in the political science department. Here at UMF, Dr. Melcher serves as the pre-law advisor and offers a wealth of knowledge about law schools across the country. Not only does Dr. Melcher serve as the university's pre-law advisor, he additionally advises UMF's annual Maine Public Policy Scholar. In addition to teaching here at the university, Dr. Melcher is one of the most sought after academics by the media regarding all topics relating to politics and law in Maine. His scholarly analysis of local politics is of the highest quality and he is cited far and wide by many researchers. More recently, Dr. Melcher collaborated with the University of Maine's own Dr. Amy Free to write a chapter analyzing Maine presidential politics with a focus on the 2020 election entitled A State Divided, Maine and its Continued Electoral Vote Split. Besides all of Dr. Melcher's achievements, awards, and achievements, awards, and scholarly work, his lucrative career advice in networking with professionals is a major asset to our university and our students. It is clear Dr. Melcher deeply cares about all the students and we are all grateful to have you as our mentor. I know he takes immense pride in seeing his students accomplish great things after leaving UMF. Today, Dr. Melcher will review several consequential Supreme Court rulings from his most recent term and will preview upcoming important cases. Now, without further delay, it is my privilege and honor to introduce to you today our distinguished speaker, Professor of Political Science, Dr. Jim Melcher. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Um, glad to see some of my, my great alumni back in the end. I don't know what to, there we go. Sometimes my brain fades in and out and it's reflected up on the screen. It just doesn't work. I uh, am delighted to see some of my alumni back here today. Uh, Seth will soon be one of my great distinguished alumni. He has been a spectacular performer, uh, is eventually headed to law school. Whatever law school gets Seth is going to be incredibly uh, lucky to have him. He has done his hometown of Belgrade completely proud, uh, and I've really enjoyed having him in a whole lot of classes. So this is the 16th time in a row I have done this, and this may be the most controversial batch of decisions uh, that we, we have seen. Uh, some people are very happy, other people are very, very unhappy. So let's see what they're happy and unhappy about. The first thing I want to talk about was this last term we just finished was the last term uh, for Justice Stephen Breyer, uh, who was appointed by President Clinton in the mid-1990s. Uh, the only person who's been on the court now longer has been Clarence Thomas, who has become markedly more important since the movement of the Supreme Court in a more uh, conservative direction. Uh, ideologically, uh, his replacement uh, Ketanji Brown Jackson, the first African American woman to serve on the Supreme Court, will likely rule in a very similar way to where Breyer had been. Not quite as far to the left on the court as Sonia Sotomayor, but certainly in that greatly diminished liberal block, uh, which is down to three justices, uh, Jackson, uh, Sonia Sotomayor, and Elena Kagan. First off, I want to mention a couple of cases that I talked about last year for those of you who are at my uh, preview, and they both, to some extent, concern the international uh, war on terror and conflict in the Middle East. First one probably needs no introduction to you. A U.S. versus Sarnayev considered the man who was 
uh, convicted of being one of two instigators of the bombing at the Boston Marathon back, uh, I believe it was 2014. Uh, his brother, who was also involved, was killed by police. He was later found guilty and sentenced to death, which is a very rare thing in federal trials. There are very few people uh, that get the death penalty in federal cases. People like Timothy McVeigh, uh, that was behind the Oklahoma City bombing, are among the very few people who had. And his fights in court aren't about whether he's guilty. He absolutely, clearly is guilty. The question is, will he get life in prison without parole, as he wants, or will he be executed? And he argued that he did not get a proper trial because jury members weren't questioned enough about what media they had watched. Obviously, there was a media firestorm, particularly in Metro Boston, where the trial was held. Probably would have been hard to find a unbi completely unbiased jur uh, jury in a case like that. But he said uh, they failed in the, I, I, Frank Undercuffler would correct me, I believe it's pronounced voir dire process, uh, where you're looking at who is serving as jurors. He said, I want a retrial on the death penalty phase. He lost six to three, but he's now looking for new grounds on which to appeal. So he is still in federal prison in Colorado. He has not yet been executed. His new appeals went in in April. Uh, so it all keeps on going. A much trickier case to understand is the US versus uh, Abu Zuba Zubaida case. Zubaida was one of the leading lieutenants of Osama bin Laden uh, in working for Al Qaeda, was captured relatively early on, and he has been subjected to what is sometimes euphemistically called extraordinary rendition. That he, as a suspect that the American government believed had knowledge of future attacks, uh, was treated very severely, was waterboarded and then was exported to another country, which he and most people believe was Poland. And that in Poland, they were able to um, interrogate him on what he and others consider to be torture. European Court of Human Rights argued that he was tortured. You will notice there's a large difference between the two pictures of him there. He went to prison with two good eyes, and he currently only has one, which he says came out of how he was treated in Poland, and he's filed a lawsuit. And he wants the contractors, the CIA hires people to do this stuff. Like you might hire a contractor to work on your house. The CIA outsourced some of this, and he said, those people took me to what I believe was Poland, I want to sue in Poland. He's still at Guantanamo. From the very few prisoners still left there, largely emptied out. And I need to know the exact location. I want data from these uh, people that work for the CIA. But the Supreme Court held seven to two that even though almost everybody is sure he was interrogated in Poland and by most people's definition tortured in Poland, it would be damaging to American national security to divulge exactly where. And you had an interesting matchup with Sonia Sotomayor, very clearly the most liberal member of the court, along with Neil Gorsuch. And one thing we're going to see about Gorsuch as we talk is Gorsuch has a general theme that he thinks the American administrative state has gotten too big and too powerful and is taking on too many examples of authority. And he said, this is an example of it. You know, you didn't really demonstrate, he argued, that this material would be damaging to American national security. I don't want the CIA making all these calls about these things. Give the guy his day in court. We already know what country it was in. They're really splitting hairs about it. So sometimes you get some interesting bipartisan links here. So. First off, I always begin with the coming attractions. I only have four that I'll put up here this year because this was probably the most momentous year of the court in the last quarter century. So I'm doing six cases from the last term. Uh, there are a lot of things already being argued. The Supreme Court started on Monday uh, with an Alabama case, the Milliken case, 
about uh, the Voting Rights Act and creating uh, districts that black voters are likely to be able to select their own congressmen. My com law students, Seth will remember, we talked about national pork producers versus Ross. I hope this doesn't make any of you too hungry for pork stir fry before, yeah, but I'll try to make my discussion as kosher as I can. 303 Creative LLC versus Olenek. Sounds boring, but this is the sequel to the Masterpiece Cake case. And I think all of you remember the Masterpiece case, Pete, Masterpiece. Well, it is in Colorado, so you know you could have a master peak. Wallach like in the back there that went to college in Colorado could, could explain that. This is about a woman who wants to host wedding websites, but she has very strong conservative Christian principles and says, I would design any other website for you. I'm not saying you're not welcome in my shop, but you are asking me as a creative professional to help assemble essentially a work of art that I can't believe in. And the Supreme Court and Masterpiece pretty much kicked the can down the road, uh, or kicked the cake down the road. Could be a cement cake. And then the really two big controversial ones. This is the case that could end affirmative action in college. Whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, there has been fighting over affirmative action in colleges in which colleges try to take action to diversify their student body, particularly racially. Going back to the late 1970s in the Bakke case, uh, this is challenging some precedents from the early 2000s, uh, the Grutter versus Bollinger case in particular from the University of Michigan. And you notice how interest groups never come up with a name anybody could oppose. You know, students for fair, who could oppose? Fair admissions. We want to make sure everybody who wants to go to the Farmington Fair can and for, for fair admissions. Students for Fair Admissions is a conservative group led by one uh, conservative activist in Texas who has been taking on government in multiple court cases over the last 20 years. Uh, he's part of the Shelby Counter County versus Holder case from Alabama from a few years ago that put very stringent limits on applications of the Voting Rights Act. He also was behind other cases about affirmative action. And he's suing two of the most prominent universities in the country. He's suing Harvard University and the University of North Carolina. Uh, he wanted to have one public and one private uh, school in there. And then Moore versus Harper, uh, which is another elections case that's really complicated to explain. So let me get into the pork. Uh, this is a case about pigs. Not guinea pigs, not the kind I have. So we have a new adorable guinea pig. Uh, but it's not about pork barrel spending. It's about actual pigs. California is the most aggressive state in the nation in voting in initiatives into law. Now, we've seen initiatives voted into law in Maine. It's how we got ranked choice voting, for example. Uh, Maine rejected an initiative about expanded background checks for firearms six years ago. We vote on a lot of them. California votes on a lot more of them than we do. And in 2018, they passed one called Proposition 12. And it, can, it was called the Farm Animal Confinement Initiative, or FACI. I, they probably could have done better with the acronym. FACI, no killy the piggy FACI. And the big issue in this are what are called gestation crates. That in many places, the standard method for farming pigs is to put pregnant sows into these kind of very tight cages in which they can't turn around. And the people in California argue this is inhumane treatment of pigs. The pork industry argues, no, this is an efficient way. It doesn't physically harm them. And why is this a Supreme Court case? Because this brings up the Commerce Clause. And if any of you have ever had any of my classes, you know that I am inordinately fond of the all-knowing, all-seeing, all-powerful Commerce Clause. This is about a fit. So we'll get into that in a second. But the law says pork from the offspring of mistreated sows. So it isn't the piglet itself that's being turned into pork. It's how the mother of that pig was treated. And the state of California has argued any pigs that were born into a mother sow in this kind of gestational crate is cruelty 
to animals and therefore can't be sold in the largest state in the country. Now, why is that a big issue? It's a big issue because California has almost no pork production of its own. Two tenths of one percent of the pork sold in California comes from there. They've got to have fields for, you know, Disneyland and making almond milk and oat milk. Don't ask me as a Wisconsin native what I think of milk. <clears throat> But so 99.8% oh, of the pork sold in California comes from another state. Commonly Midwestern states like Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota, and other states. And the pork producers argue that this violates something called the Hidden Commerce Clause. What is the Hidden Commerce Clause? Does it mean it gets under here? Does, is it hiding? Is it afraid of somebody? Hidden Commerce Clause is also sometimes called the Private Commerce Clause, also sometimes called the Dormant Commerce Clause. But that might make you feel like you're in a mood for a nap, and so I don't want to talk about anything dormant. I've always learned it as the Hidden Commerce Clause. The Hidden Commerce Clause argues the power to regulate interstate commerce belongs to Congress. You can't mess with interstate commerce if you are a state. Now, obviously, states make various decisions that affect interstate commerce. Are you going to allow marijuana to be sold in your state? Are you going to allow fireworks to be sold in your state? Both of which have changed in Maine in my time in Maine. Uh, we had a famous case about 20 years ago in Maine about the illegal importation of bait fish called golden shiners from New Hampshire and whether or not Maine was violating the Hidden Commerce Clause in a case like this. And the pork producers say, you're violating the Hidden Commerce Clause. You don't have a right. You're affecting interstate commerce. All this pork is coming in from out of state. You've effectively passed a national law that one, um, what, one in eight uh, meat pork comes uh, it is sold in California, and so this has a major interstate effect. And they argue this violates the Hidden Commerce Clause. National government wants to regulate that? Fine. California, though, is basically passing a law nobody else in the country could vote on that affects a lot of producers, and the pork producers are squealing mad about this whole sort of, sort of thing. First, from the Commerce Clause, states can't excessively uh, burden interstate commerce. The most famous case of this is a case from the late 1950s that John Stewart used to talk about called Navajo Freight Lines versus Bibb. This is a case where Illinois had a different size mud flap requirement for trucks from every other state in the United States. So theoretically, if you're driving over the border from Wisconsin into Illinois, you had to pull over and change your mud flaps. And then if you continued on to Indiana, you had to change your mud flaps again. And naturally, the Navajo Freight Lines thought that this was a bit of a burden, kind of violating the Hidden Commerce Clause. And the Supreme Court said, you're messing too much with interstate commerce. You can't do that. Some of you might recall a case from my hometown, Madison, where uh, the city was trying to practice protectionism against an out-of-state milk producer, Dean Milk, which is now part of the Morningstar Group, large, large group of uh, dairy companies. And they said, well, we care about safety. They were lying through their teeth. We care about safety and purity. And, uh, and even though they're refrigerated trucks now, we can't allow any milk sold that was bottled more than 15 state miles from the city, 15 miles from the city limits. It was kind of like a really obvious, let's stick it to the Illinois people, which trust me, Wisconsin people are always quite ready to do. The Supreme Court said, you can't do that. You're, you're taking on some of these functions that properly only belong to the national government. And a lot of it is about limiting protectionism. So one argument California has made is, we don't have a pork industry to protect. We don't have pigs. We don't have a pork industry. We're not passing this to advantage like Madison was trying to help its dairy producers and hurt the other ones. We're not doing anything that's helping our pork industry. We're not violating the Hidden Commerce Clause. Next case, Creative LLC versus Olenek. Um, it's a sequel to a very famous case called the Masterpiece Cake Bakery case. And they both from, come from Colorado, and they both involve businesses that ran into trouble when they refused to perform services 
to LGBT plus people. See down there in the lower case, there's the man who owned the Masterpiece Cake Bakery, and on the right is a gay couple that wanted them, wanted to commission them to make a cake. And he told them, I'll sell you anything else in the store. I'm not prohibiting against you based on your sexual orientation, but you're asking me to put my artistic process to work. That's compelled speech. And compelled speech, when the government makes people say something, tends to be very difficult to justify. Could you go to a black artist and say, I want you to paint a painting of the Ku Klux Klan or Southern victories in the Civil War? Can you make somebody do something that they wouldn't do? Or could you ask a uh, atheist painter to paint a picture of Jesus showing him, you know, resurrected from the cross? And so to a large extent, you've got a conflict between freedom of speech laws and freedom of religion and the LGBT community. And down there, the woman on the right is a woman named Lori Smith. She has opened a business. It was one of these people who choose a second career, go off and to do things. And my second career is going to be designing websites. I want to celebrate the love that God created between a man and a woman. Bold italics underline between a man and a woman. And she said, look, if I was doing other web stuff, I'm not saying I'd discriminate against them. I draw the line at you asking me to do something that violates my conservative Christian faith. And she wanted to put a notice on her website. One of the things that happened in Masterpiece is the gay couple that wanted a cake had no idea they'd be turned down. They were completely blindsided. And the baker was kind of surprised to see them too. She's trying to avoid that. She wants to put up on her website, hey, I only do wedding websites for a man and a woman getting married. Uh, call me if you're a same-sex couple. I'll help you find somebody who will work with you on these other kinds of things, but I can't do it and be true to what I believe in. And she wanted to put a notice saying so on her website. Colorado law prohibits such a statement saying in advance, I'm going to make a discriminatory policy against you. So she hasn't even put this up, she hasn't been prosecuted. You could question whether this is actually a live controversy or not. But she has argued this has slowed down my ability to start my business. So Masterpiece really didn't make a decision. In Masterpiece, the Supreme Court said, well, the Colorado Commission that regulates this stuff said a whole lot of things that showed that they were really biased against religious people. And so we're going to send that case back down. We're going to remand it, but we're not really going to settle the bigger, uh, bigger question on these things. And we talk about compelled speech. OK, now we start. If those weren't controversial enough for you, now we start getting into affirmative action. Certain minority groups, people of color, are underrepresented in American colleges. And starting in the 1960s and early 70s, a lot of colleges started saying, we want to diversify our student body. We think it'll be not only good for the new students admitted, but we think it will be healthy for students from the dominant culture to meet some other people, meet some folks who are different. It actually has value in terms of the college educational experience. And you may remember, well, some of my students, actually none of my students are old enough to remember, but back in the 70s, there was a case involving a white man named Alan Bakke who wanted to get into medical school. And the University of California Davis told him, you can't get into medical school. Your grades aren't quite high enough. And we've reserved specific spots for women and people of color, what are called quotas. We have this many chairs reserved for them. And therefore, you won't be able to get in. Uh, he eventually goes to, um, he eventually does get his medical degree. Uh, and practice, and the Supreme Court said, you can look at race among a whole menu of other factors. Are they a good flute player? Were they uh, valedictorian in their class? Did their mother give $6 million to help build the new gym? Is he Biff Buffington the 12th, the 12th person to go to our school? Oh, well, we can't let a Buffington not get into here, can we? 
So there have always been a whole lot of other factors besides your GPA and your SAT scores. And the Supreme Court said in Bakke, you can look at race, but you can't save spots. You can't say, we've got this many chairs for women, or this many chairs for African Americans, or for Native Americans, uh, or whoever. And that got narrowed a little bit in the Bollinger rulings in the early 2000s, but it's basically still there. The kind of thing that's different in this case is an argument that these colleges are discriminating against Asian Americans. And this is something that Chinese Americans in particular have become increasingly vocal about. Uh, right now, Harvard's enrollment is slightly over 25% Asian. And so affirmative action as a set of programs designed to increase representation of people who weren't represented usually does not include women who outnumber men pretty significantly in college by now, nor does it include Asians. And a lot of Chinese in particular have said, this is racism in the name of fighting racism. You're making it harder for our group. So people sometimes think of affirmative action as white men against everybody else. That's not always how these issues uh, play out. So that fellow on the left, go figure, it's a white man that's not happy about affirmative action. I know it's a shocker. A man named Edward Bloom, a uh, very prominent political activist in Texas. Uh, he fought against Shelby Counter, uh, in Shelby County versus Holder. He was responsible for funding litigation that uh, diluted the uh, Voting Rights Act of 1965. The Fisher versus University of Texas case that I talked about, about a woman who wanted to get into the University of Texas and argued, I didn't get in because I was a white woman. She eventually had to settle for going to LSU, which isn't that bad. Better football team these days, anyway. Um, and so this is a real challenge, those cases coming out of Michigan in the early 2000s that said, you can use race as one factor, but you have to have a good reason. And what they upheld in Bollinger was the law school saying, we need enough minority students to make the other students feel comfortable. We need to get to a critical mass. Nobody wants to be the one black student or the one Indian student, and they'll learn from this, but we're not doing quotas. I think it's very likely that affirmative action in colleges under this court is likely to be struck completely, particularly in the North Carolina case. In the North Carolina case, Ketanji Brown Jackson has recused herself. Uh, she is a graduate of Harvard Law, and everybody on the Supreme Court except for Barrett is a graduate of Harvard or Yale. She went to this little school in Indiana called Notre Dame University. Poor, poor. <laughs> uh, yeah, the Supreme Court is not diverse in terms. We haven't had, I can't think of the last time we had somebody from a public law school on the Supreme Court. I, 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 I might be in the 1960s. Maybe, uh, maybe Abe Fortas might have. Um, but that said, you got to have a good reason for doing that. I think, and she, she is recused. Um, Ketanji Brown Jackson is on the board of Harvard University. And a number of conservatives say, you really shouldn't be on this case. You work for Harvard. You help set policies for Harvard. And she said, you know what? You're right. I will not be voting on that side of the case. Uh, so she's only going to be present in the North Carolina thing. Uh, and I think race is, I think uh, race in college admissions, whether you think it's a good thing or a bad thing, is in deep trouble. Of course, Moore versus Harper, we saw all this fighting years ago on the Mary Tyler Moore show between Valerie Harper and Mary Tyler Moore. They argued about, you know, their ch no, it's not actually about them. Um, neither of them is alive anymore, sadly. It's a wildly confusing case, and it's one that's got a lot of liberals completely worried and losing sleep at night and sweating. And it's about North Carolina and something called the independent state legislature theory. Jamie, if I was going to ask a quiz about anything after this that I thought students would mess up, it would be the independent state legislature theory. It's a relatively modern theory, first articulated by William Rehnquist in the Bush versus Gore case in 2000 that wound up ending the recount uh, in the election that made George W. Bush uh, president in 2000. And a number of conservative scholars and at least three conservatives on the Supreme Court say they interpret the Constitution 
as giving state legislatures power over determining the winners of elections. If that sounds familiar, this is the argument Donald Trump's lawyers used in 2020, arguing we should seat these alternate legislators, these alternate electors that state legislatures in these Republican states have chosen, we should seat those. So we've seen this argument before. The defenders of it say, well, we wouldn't have to go as far as Trump did, you know, it's a legit theory. But it also kind of goes against where the framers were on legislatures. The framers really didn't trust or like legislatures very much. That's a lot of why they created the Constitution. They tended to think the legislatures have run wild, they're giving debtors too much trouble, look at Shays' rebellion in Massachusetts, look at all these things. Framers weren't big on giving legislatures a whole lot of independent power. States, yes. Legislatures specifically, not at all. And so this has come up in North Carolina. North Carolina has a Democratic governor and an overwhelmingly Republican state legislature. And they have passed two maps, the state Supreme Court, for congressional elections that Democrats say are heavily gerrymandered. And the state Supreme Court has said those are gerrymandered. They don't fit in the North Carolina Constitution. So after their second loss at the Supreme Court, they said, you know what? We believe in this whole idea of the legislature being supreme on these things. And they use the elections clause of the Constitution. Nobody can question what the legislature has unless Congress passes a new law about it. This would be a massive shift of power toward state legislatures, which in many cases, both Democratic and Republican, are severely gerrymandered and could lead to some very strange implications uh, indeed. So the argument here, if this gets passed, would give legislatures a lot of power in federal elections to question uh, the results for races for uh, the presidency and for Congress. The new electoral act that appears on its way to President Biden's desk would neutralize some but not all uh, of, these, of these matters, and there's some of the things it could do. So now, six cases from the last term. And if you're a conservative, this is going to make you really, really happy. Because it's pretty much a six case winning streak for conservative positions. If you're a liberal, it may give you a sad. So that's my trigger warning, you know, if you feel strongly about these, and you've probably heard of most of these cases. Had to pick the local one. Had to pick the case from Boston, which believe it or not, you didn't think this was possible. Nine nothing decision. Yes, even an ideologically cut in half Supreme Court could all agree on which side should win this case. Kennedy versus Bremerton School District, the second of three cases we'll talk about that concern religion. This is the praying football coach case uh, from suburban Seattle. Carson versus Macon. We could go main state Supreme Court case about vouchers and sending students, if you live out in the boonies and you don't got to high school yourself, whether or not you can send them to, you know, St. Dom's or Temple Academy, or Temple Academy and Bangor Christian were the two schools uh, specifically uh, involved in, uh, in, that, that, uh, in that particular case. Um, and so the Supreme Court looked at Maine for the first time in a long time. New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin. Would you guess this might be a firearms case? Would you guess it might be a case about state firearms regulation? major expansion of gun owner rights to the largest extent ever in American constitutional law. West Virginia versus EPA. I thought I'd see some of my natural science colleagues here who want to talk about coal and global warming and all those sort of things. And then that one, which is the case that overturned this precedent from 48 years ago called Roe versus Wade that you probably, okay, pretty major case. So first I want to talk about Shirtliff versus City of Boston. If you see down there in the lower left-hand corner, the City of Boston has three flagpoles outside City Hall in that giant cement monstrosity at Government Center that they have over there. The only thing growing are flagpoles. So <laughs> it's pretty, some, maybe some dandelions through the cracks. So that picture there at lower left is what you have. One flagpole always has the American flag, and the uh, POW MIA flag. The second flag has the flag of the state of Massachusetts. The third flag usually has the city of Boston flag, 
But from time to time, they allow different groups to apply for the privilege of having their flag up for an hour. Short period, not a permanent flag. But like, OK, the, um, we're having this big group coming to town. We'd like to put up a flag. Or the Red Sox won the, well, not this year, but the Red Sox won the World Series. We want to put up a Red Sox flag. All things that are non-permanent, temporary, non-governmental flags. And usually, they're pretty cool with it. Pretty good winning streak. 284 groups asked to have their flag up, and 284 of them got what they wanted, until that flag down at the lower right hand came up. Something called the American Protestant flag. It's been around since the late 1890s. Uh, you will usually see it outside of conservative churches. Uh, on my way up this morning, I saw it outside the Greater Augusta Christian Fellowship, which is a conservative organization. That's where you usually will see it, but some mainline churches do it too. And there is a conservative group led by this man on the left, a man named Hal Shirtliff. He's wearing a jacket. He's not Shirtliff at all. He's... I was wondering what, what da how Daffy Duck or Sylvester would talk about. There's nobody Shirtliff in this case. Uh, and that's a uh, pastor at a uh, church in Boston both holding this outside. You might recognize that's the Moakley Courthouse in Boston, which has a lot of inspirational quotes, and it didn't take long for them to find one to stand in front of and take their picture. And Hal Shirtliff heads an organization called Camp Constitution. You know, they roast liberals on the open fire, and do all those sort of things, have some s'mores. You can't lose with s'mores, as the woman keeps telling me on the AAA ads. It's a conservative organization, conservative Christian organization. Uh, conservative enough that they've uh, got a quote from, they've got an article from John Birch, who founded the Birch Society, very conservative Republicans on. They have a link to the Constitution Party website for people who think the Republicans are dangerous, commie pinko liberals, and you need something more conservative, would be the Constitution. They're quite conservative. And they apply and they become the one. So now we go from 284 to nothing to 284 to one. City of Boston says, your flag's got a cross on it. Your flag represents Christianity. I know we've approved every other possible flag. You're not getting your flag up there. And when he heard they cited the Establishment Clause and saying why, it didn't take him two minutes to figure out, I'm going to take this to court as an example of what is called viewpoint-based discrimination. Government has a very high burden if it discriminates against views expressed. So if the state of Maine said, we're going to ban billboards except Democrats can have billboards, that would be viewpoint-based discrimination. You can ban all the billboards, but you can't do it in a way that favors one group over another. And they said, well, this does this. We've had a number of cases about the government being connected to speech. Uh, some of you might remember the cases where the Sons of Confederate Veterans wanted to have a Confederate symbol on one of the 220 state license plates the state of Texas offered. And the Supreme Court said Texas can turn that down. It's got the state name on it. It's permanent. Somebody will drive around with this for years. It's not a temporary one-off like the flag up for one hour. It doesn't seem to be indicated. In, this in the other case, they said, that's showing government approval. It's government speech. Mr. Shirtliff said, this isn't government speech. It's a neutral forum. All kinds of groups have gotten to have their flag up. You're violating both our freedom of speech and our free exercise of religion if you don't give us the same chance you gave all these other groups. Would you believe a unanimous decision? Thomas and Sotomayor are all going out to salute the flag and stand, yeah, nine nothing for shirtlift. Uh, Breyer wrote the decision, one of the last decisions Breyer wrote, appropriately so, is Breyer used to teach at Harvard Law School. And they argued that his First Amendment rights, both of free exercise and speech, were violated. The city, uh, or the, the court, cited the pattern. They said, look, it's really clear you let a lot of different groups do this. They're not advocating violence, they're not advocating something that would be dangerous to the community. It's not incitement to riot. You're demonstrating viewpoint-based discrimination. So that picture there 
shows the one hour they got uh, in August, two months ago. They finally got the right to fly their flag for the one hour. And the one hour is really kind of what groups want. They want a chance to take pictures. They're not saying we're going to put this up permanently. This is different from, say, putting the Ten Commandments on a marble statue in front of your lawn of your state capitol that's there permanently. The Supreme Court argued, and I think correctly so, that this was not a government endorsement or an establishment of religion. It was a matter of freedom of speech. All right. The rest of these are not unanimous decisions. But I hope they have a prayer of interesting you. This is a case about a man down there at the lower left named Joseph Kennedy. Not the one who was JFK's dad. He's, he's gone. This is an assistant football coach at a high school uh, outside of Seattle, Washington. And he had a practice of going after the game to going to midfield and offering his thanks to God, saying, you know, I'm grateful for the chance to coach young people. It's part of my free expression. It's just me. The problem started when some of his students on the football team saw him. Can we come join you? Can we pray along with you? And he said, sure, come and do this. And two students turned into 10, turned into 20, and turned into what you see down there at the bottom or even people from the other team were coming over to pray after the game, that you've literally got two dozen people that they were actually running over people to get to midfield. Uh, one thing that Sotomayor is correct about is that Gorsuch, Gorsuch decision didn't talk at all about all the fray, all the conflict. There was way more of it, and Sotomayor correctly called them out about it. So the school district saw this and said, look, we know you've got a right to pray, you're not, if it's something that, first off, this isn't in school, it's not a captive audience, this is not like praying in a classroom. This is after school, we recognize that, we realize that this probably isn't coercive, but kids on the football team might feel pressure. They might think, I'm going to get a lot more playing time if I do pray with you, or I might get a lot less playing time if I don't, that in essence there was sort of a backdoor coercion to what was going on. And the school district said, look, uh, we can come up with some other things for you to do. If you pray at midfield and don't bring any students with you, we're okay with that. We just don't want it to look like we're coercing students into joining things. And he held firm. He said, I'm not going to compromise. I'm going to keep praying the way that I have. I have a free speech right. and." a First Amendment right of free exercise of religion. So after the last case where he couldn't agree with them, the, they put him on leave. Uh, the head coach recommended that he not be offered a new contract. The head coach resigned after receiving numerous death threats from people angry. The school district was restraining the prayer. And Kennedy wound up taking a new job in Florida at the other end uh, of the country. So whether or not it actually is, a, is not a moot case is a good question. This is one of a series of cases we see that are a 6-3 straight ideological down the line win. The three liberals said that the school district was justified, the rest didn't. By the way, that's him kneeling and praying in front of the Supreme Court, which is constitutionally permissible because there aren't any students around him that he flew in from Washington State. And this has become a major change in the test that the Supreme Court has used. Alito, in writing the decision, very explicitly says the old lemon test that was commonly used, that tended to be quite restrictive, uh, is gone. Rights need to be demonstrated in terms of history and tradition. If something has been a right that's been around a long time, people have done for a long time, that gives it more credit. There's a very conservative view of rights. Makes it very difficult for any new rights to pop up which is going to come up in some of these other cases. Gorsuch argued, if you don't hold for Kennedy, it would mean a Muslim teacher wouldn't be allowed to wear a headscarf at school, or a Christian teacher couldn't pray over lunch in the school cafeteria. Now, it has to be said, Kennedy was very vocal in advocating for his job. He, and you know, I understand why he would. I'm not criticizing him for it. But it wasn't a silent case at all. He was very vocal, went to the media, got national attention. Um, but we don't know what's going to happen on these. It doesn't mean prayer is going to come back to classrooms, 
but it certainly is a move toward less restriction uh, of prayer. And as I said, Sotomayor quite, quite accurately questioned Gorsuch's version of that. Carson versus Macon. This is the main case about school vouchers. Now, we haven't had a main case in a while. Uh, some of you might remember my alum, William Chinnick, uh, who wrote a 95-page senior thesis about the last time we got into the Supreme Court, a case called Boisin versus United States, better known to my students as the idiot who shot a bald eagle and bragged about it in a bar in Mattawamkeg case. Shooting bald eagles, not a good idea. Bragging about doing something illegal in a bar, also a bad idea. Doing this when you are federally banned from owning a gun in the first place, and now the government has a confession. Triple bad idea. Now, William is a very conservative student, and he argued the law under which he was convicted was invalid. I didn't agree with him. But William is now in law school. Uh, William just started at Quinnipiac Law School. Uh, a pre-law journal has asked him to publish his a shortened version of his thesis. Uh, first student I've ever had to publish in a pre-law journal. We can be really proud here at UMF uh, of William. He's doing really, really well for himself. And he would have noted, if he were here, that there was a big court case two years ago that really opens the door for government funding of religion in schools. There's a case from Montana called Espinoza versus Montana Department of Revenue. Montana had a tax program that paid parents back if they sent their kids to a private school, but it excluded private religious schools. And there was a single mother named Espinoza who said, well, I don't have a lot of money, I'm a single mother, I ought to be able to send my child to uh, this Christian school down the way, and the state said you can't do it. The Supreme Court ruled in her favor and said, you don't have to offer money, but if you do, you can't relieve religious groups out of it. So a lot of people in Maine have been fighting to be able to send their kids to religious schools going back to the, to the uh, 1990s. We're going on a long, long time. And the case here is about people who live in towns where there isn't a high school. And the town's not part of a school district. So if you live in, say, Durham, Maine, not Durham, North Carolina, they've got high schools, I'm pretty sure. If you live in Durham, Maine, you could choose to go to, say, Mount Ararat, or go to Freeport, or go to Brunswick. But you can't go to St. Dominic's. It's a Catholic school. You want to go there? You've got to pay for it yourself. And a lot of parents have argued, this isn't fair to us. Rich kids have that choice of all these schools. Why shouldn't we? And the state has always argued it would violate the Establishment Clause. That it would mean direct government support for uh, religion. And there's uh, one of the girls that was involved in the case and her mother uh, in front of Bangor Christian Schools. There's a conservative Christian school in Bangor why it's called Bangor Christian School. Uh, the other is Temple Academy in, uh, in Waterville. By the way, speaking of my successful law student graduates, uh, another of our students who is an alum of uh, Temple Academy, Montana Towers, another brilliant student, has just started his first year of law at the University of Maine Law School. So we are getting people out to these really good uh, positions. So the Carson family said, this is discriminatory. I should be able to send, I think they lived in, um, they lived in, in Orrington, if I recall correctly. They were in Orrington or Glenburn, said, we want to send our, okay, you're saying we can send our kid to Bucksport or Bangor. Why can't we send our kid to Bangor Christian? The state said, we got rules against that. You can't, we got to be funding religion. And family in Palermo wanted to send their kids to Temple Academy, uh, very close to Thomas College uh, on the south side of Waterville. Uh, and there's one of the families that wanted to send their kids. There's Temple Academy right down there in Waterville. Uh, and there is Ms. Macon, who is the head of school, uh, head of the education department for the state of Maine. And in Maine court, they'd always lost. Years and years and years, these families had lost. But Espinoza opens the door for them. And the Supreme Court, again, on that same conservative liberal uh, breaking point goes six to three for the parents. This violates their free exercise rights. State doesn't have to fund sending somebody to a high school. And I think this is a different case from Espinoza, because here, the other program was really something more optional. Here you've got to send a kid to some high school, go somewhere. I'm not sure I would be quite as, on, I'm not on board with this as much as I might be on, on Espinoza. Uh, most states don't have this as an issue. The only states that do this are Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. 
So the direct effect is really only in this part of the country. But it's going to lead to a lot more pressure uh, to have religious schools included in vouchers. However, in Maine, the effect is going to be very limited. The state of Maine puts a lot of requirements on what schools get money. Among other things, you can't discriminate on the basis of LGBTQ status. You can't say, you're gay, I'm not working, you can't work at my school. Or, they also have to offer that kind of admission to students. You're not allowed to get money from the state and say, you're a lesbian student, you can't go to our school. And so, Temple Academy and Bangor Christian, as conservative Christian schools, have always had a test that you can't be gay or lesbian, those students aren't welcome in the school. And so they would be very unlikely to get money from the state anyway. The only school that applied and the state approved it was Chevres, which is a school a lot of you know is a Catholic high school in Portland. They applied, they said, we don't discriminate in the ways that you're worried about. And the state said, fine, if you're, you have kids in that, I don't know who'd live close enough to Chevres that doesn't have a high school to use that. Because uh, like Portland has high schools and you know, Freeport has high schools. But Chevres would do so, but right now they're going to be the only school. So this has more kind of symbolic effect that's actually going to affect things. Oh, bang. Uh, New York State Rifle and Pistol Association. Got to get through these. I don't have a whole lot of time left. You may remember them from a few years ago bringing a case to the Supreme Court about the right of gun owners to transport their guns from their regular home to their summer home. And you'll recall that McDonald versus Chicago, the Supreme Court said, the purpose of the Second Amendment is home protection. That's why it's in there. Now, Scalia looked at that as a textualist and said, where the heck did you get that? You're right, the, you're voting on the right side for the guns, but like you are making stuff up. Scalia could side with you and tell you why you got the right decision, but a wrong for 40 pages was kind of a Scalia specialty. But McDonald said, you've got a right to a gun to defend your house. So New York got rid of that law even before it got to the court, but now they're going for something much bigger. New York State, like many states, says you have to show cause to get a concealed weapons permit. For example, a stalker has been bothering you, or an ex-husband or an ex-boyfriend is endangering you, or you're a prosecutor that's angered the mafia, which may or may not exist in New York State. <laughs> kind of think they do. All right, you gotta, have a, you gotta have a good reason. It can't just be, oh, I feel like this to scare the cashiers uh, at Walmart. You, you need to have a particular reason. And the Pistol Association said, why do we need a reason? Clarence Thomas argued there is no other constitutional right where you've gotta get clearance for the government before you use it. Now, that's not quite true. I can't suddenly have a parade of 500 people down Front Street without asking the government first, is it okay that we block all the traffic to Ron's? But that's Thomas's argument. That the argument a lot of gun owners have made is the Second Amendment shouldn't be seen as a second class right compared to these other things, and the Supreme Court ruled for them. So this goes way beyond McDonald. McDonald said you got a right to have a gun at home or going between your homes. Now, states can still have a permit to keep felons out, but now the burden is very much on the state about why they're doing it. And one thing that was successful in their argument was the gun owners said, this gives way too much discretion to local officials. And there were groups of black gun owners. One was called Black Guns Matter. I haven't seen a lot of chartreuse or pink guns. Well, there are pink guns, actually. That said, well, it seems like when they turn down concealed carry permits, it's almost always for a black person who wants one and white people get it. This seems to have way too much discretion for the local officials. But it's a pretty uh, broad statement, but it doesn't mean they're going to expand things. Uh, on Monday, they denied a suit called Gun Owners of America versus Garland that wanted to repeal a Trump administration restriction on bump stocks. The Trump administration put a restriction on bump stocks that uh, allow semi-automatic weapons to fire more quickly after the Las Vegas hotel shooting at a country music festival. The Supreme Court did not take the case, so that restriction on bump stocks is still legal. So goes a certain distance, but not as far as some gun owners might have liked. West Virginia versus EPA, another big win for conservatives. Some say this is the biggest environmental case in 15 years. Uh, and it concerns something President Obama put through that was a plan about clean power. 
and it was called the Clean Power Plan. It's not rocket science, it's political science. That's why they let me teach it. The Obama administration wanted to try and push utility companies away from using coal, which puts a lot of carbon into the air, and moving to other things that put less carbon into the air. Theoretically, things like solar and wind, but also things like natural gas. They wanted to get people off of coal. And they were sued immediately, and the Supreme Court approved an injunction. Okay, we're stopping that for now. Stop right there. You didn't think I'd quote meatloaf today, but I'm really hungry, and I'm thinking about, let me sleep on it. So they put it in, the Trump administration sure as hell wasn't going to take this out of the freezer and say, why, yes, I want to stick it to the coal states. They loved him. We're going to bring back coal. It's going to be better than ever is one of the things that he said. So he wasn't going to bring it back, but Biden wanted to. And the Supreme Court said the EPA doesn't have the power to do this. And they cited something. The reason why I have Frank Gorshin as the Riddler down there there used to be a show called Batman that I watched after school when I was little. He always wore question marks on a green outfit. I see him as the symbol of the major questions doctrine. What the Supreme Court said was, if you've got something big like this, like major federal government efforts to push away from coal, this should be something Congress expresses the will to do real, real directly. That this is, you know, let the bureaucracy make calls on little piddly things. This is too big. If you really think so, this is a major question. And it's another place, much like the CIA case, where Gorsuch said, I think the administrative state is too big. And I think this is a way we've got to rein in what the bureaucracy can do. But it didn't do what a lot of conservatives want. It did not overturn something called Chevron deference. So my wife and I were driving in California. You know, I wasn't sure where to go. And she said, let's go to the Chevron station. And I deferred to my. Chevron deference comes out of a famous court case from about 30 years ago in which the Supreme Court said, unless they're acting in a way that's really egregiously overpowering, you ought to defer when Congress hasn't made something clear to what the bureaucracy says something means. Chevron deference gives a trainload of power to bureaucracies to interpret laws like environmental laws. And a lot of conservatives do not like turning over the keys to the car to the EPA or these other, other groups. So they've been chomping at the bit for years. Get rid of the Chevron deference. But Chevron deference isn't completely turned off. One of the questions about this was what the EPA was doing was regulating power overall and not just regulating individual power plants, what people who study this call inside the fence versus outside the fence. That it's more justifiable for the EPA to regulate what a single plant does than put on requirements for the system as a whole, which is why I found that inside the fence thing. And a lot of environmentalists are very upset about this, but it may have been the spur for uh, the Biden administration to pass probably the largest spending package to fight global warming in American history. It was part of something that didn't really deal with inflation a lot called the Inflation Reduction Act. Actually did way more about things like the environment, money for solar, money for wind, less coercive to people operating coal power plants, much more carrots than the Obama administration sticks. I think it's gonna work a lot better than what the Obama administration did. And Biden can go to the Supreme Court and say, well, we got something, it was passed. It was real explicit. Doesn't tell the bureaucracy. You know, the bureaucracy doesn't know. How do you like those crunchy pieces of coal? OK, here we go. Can we promise we'll all be friends after we discuss this? This is the case that overturns Roe. Roe, as you know, was the court case that declared 46 of the 50 states as laws restricting abortion to be unconstitutional, including Maine. Are there are only four states in the country where uh, they had abortion access, what we had after uh, Roe, and none of them in the middle of the country. They're all on either the West Coast or like New York, we're on the uh, East Coast, and it set up a trimester division. The argument made by Blackman, who was used to arguing for medical clinics, he had been the lawyer for the Mayo Clinic before he got, he was thinking, how do we do this so that it's fair to doctors? How do we do this so it's fair to clinics, and he said, okay, the longer a pregnancy goes, the more the government's got a right to do something about it. First third of pregnancy, government's got to leave it alone. 
Second third, government can put in regulations. Third third of pregnancy, you can make it totally illegal, and most states do. Except, and third trimester abortions mostly happen in the case of something very severely uh, wrong with the fetus or something that's a real threat. Some state laws have been, limits have been permitted. Uh, the federal government, or the Supreme Court said, uh, said states can put limits on minors seeking abortions, as long as there's a judge or somebody you're not related to uh, that you can go to. Uh, they allowed Missouri to prevent public hospitals from performing abort. They allowed a lot of limits as long as they didn't pose what Sandra Day O'Connor called an undue burden. And that case comes out of a very important case called Planned Parenthood versus Casey. You can limit abortion, but don't make it too hard for people. You know, government doesn't have to provide money for them. We can say this group can't provide them. But don't you go so far as to shut down abortion completely. Of course, what's an undue burden? It's whatever Sandra Day O'Connor thought an undue burden was. Vagueness leads to fighting. So states have been chipping away at this for years, but they've almost always said, oh, we don't want to overturn Roe. Oh, we wouldn't ask for that. Oh, we just want to nibble, pick a little bit. Do you ever have a chocolate bunny? I don't want to eat the whole chocolate bunny. I just like a little nibble of the ears. I, I just like this, and you know, they're getting pretty close to the head by the end of this stuff. Uh, the ears were pretty nearly gone. And Mississippi explicitly said, I want you to get rid of Roe. This trimester approach makes no sense. It's badly, our conservatives have ragged on, on how this has been done for years. And they said, we're banning abortions after 15 weeks, and we want to overturn Roe. So that's a big change. Nobody else had been saying, we want to chuck Roe completely. They were all saying, oh, you can do our restrictions, but, but Roe's still a lot. You still have a chocolate bunny. The chocolate bunny just doesn't have ears or a head. But there is still, there is still a chocolate bunny. Court divided. Justice Roberts did what I thought the court would do. He said, Mississippi's law is constitutional. But I don't think we should overturn Roe versus Wade. So Mississippi wins, but this is a really huge change you're asking the public to do. And Roberts believes in precedent. Probably the greatest advocate of precedent of any justice in Supreme Court history. And he said, that is way too big a pill for the whole public to swallow all at one time. So yeah, I'm fine with Mississippi. No, I don't think Roe is well decided. I really don't think you should try and get rid of the entire bunny. Leave a little bunny. Leave a little bit of the chocolate bunny feet, perhaps. Uh, the losing side, quite angry, as you might expect. The conservatives had different views. Roberts was of the view that 15 weeks is fine, but you shouldn't go banning abortions beyond that. Thomas, on the other hand, not only said, well, getting rid of Roe is fine. He said, I'm not sure about the whole right to privacy thing. I think there's a whole lot of other rights that maybe we should take a look at, like same-sex marriage rights, or contraceptive rights, or a lot of other things that flow from the idea from Griswold versus Connecticut that there is a constitutionally guaranteed right to privacy. Nobody else would go as far as Thomas does. But I do think it's true to say the things that were decided on privacy after Roe are not as safe as the things decided before. I think that, uh, first off, you need to bring a case to court. I don't think any state's going to pass a law banning contraceptives. I do think there are laws in states in the South that would gladly pass a law repealing same-sex marriage. I would say that's more where the pressure is going to be. And Alito said, again, that rights have to go way, way back. In fact, he goes back to a famous English writer of the 1700s, one that said some really controversial things like, executing witches is okay, and various other things. And he cites that. It's tradition. It's good. You can't make up new rights. So Alito is a very new approach to rights. And he compares Roe to Plessy versus Ferguson, which probably, even if you've never studied law, you know is the case that said it's okay for the government to mandate racial segregation, which is overturned partially, but nowhere near completely in Brown versus Board. Uh, he said that it was egregiously wrong on the day it was decided. Roe was also egregiously wrong and deeply damaging. And he says this is a good thing. Now we'll have a democratic debate in all the states. We'll have a pleasant little chat about abortion. You know, we'll, we'll just sit down over some tea and some, we'll go over to Rennie's and get some cookies and 
we'll just have this nice little friendly chat. It'd be more democratic. And it's not anti-women because women feel this way on both sides and they'll be able to participate. He even went so far as to say he thought it would reduce tensions around abortion. Now, I think that's certainly true of people who are pro-life on abortion. I really don't think the National Organization for Women got the memo that this was going to reduce tensions on their part. But conservatives have argued for years, look, this is something that is important. It's a major question. It's something that ought to be decided by uh, the public in various uh, sorts of places. So what's going to happen? Well, a lot of states aren't going to have a democratic dialogue because they've had laws going back to the 19th century. Wisconsin now has a law written in 1849, a year after it became a state, that will now kick in and ban abortions. Uh, and the Republican legislature, when the governor said, we should amend our state constitution to have a referendum on the question, uh, convened for 15 seconds and then adjourned the session and said, okay, we legally met, we're not talking about it, see you, goodbye. Some states have passed new restrictive bans, but others have gone the other way. Kansas had its famous vote in which Kansas said, we're upholding the right to abortion in our state constitution. Michigan is voting on abortion this fall. Uh, and when I talked about those other rights, um, the abortion debate is now going to it's going to take up a lot of the air out of the room that we won't have time to talk about other stuff. Uh, and, and I think it's actually going to help the Democratic Party in the current elections. I think uh, in a lot of the country, this is going to be something that they use to motivate turnout. The Supreme Court's public approval level is now the lowest it has been since the advent of polling. Now, if you're a conservative, you could quite accurately argue, isn't this what liberals shoved down on us in the 60s? when they got rid of segregation, when they uh, made it harder for the police to do their job, when they did all those things. It's not entirely different. Uh, they do raise some interesting questions there, but the public has tended to think the court has gone too far. And Kagan and Alito had a nasty little exchange of the kind only Supreme Court justices can have who aren't in the same state at the same time. Kagan gave a speech where she said, if over time the court loses all connection with the public and with public sentiment, which you can read between the lines of, I think we just did that. That is a dangerous thing for democracy. And Alito, who no matter what you think of his ideas, is a really smart guy, knew she was talking about him. Alito was not happy that he had just been dissed quite this publicly and fired back, saying or implying that the court is becoming an illegitimate institution or questioning our integrity. <laughs> questioning my integrity is crossing an important line. One thing I do worry about is I worry that the Supreme Court is going to find it difficult to come together and argue things through as well as they used to. Uh, and I think there's a lot of reason to have uh, concern about that, in my opinion. Now, I don't have a whole lot of time left. I could talk about a dozen more cases. But right now, one last chance for me to put my favorite picture up. This is Stephen Breyer reading Cat in the Hat to a group of hatted children on the floor of the Supreme Court, which I just think is completely awesome. So I've got about 10 minutes left. I have to take care of my paying customers in American government at 120. Uh, but who has some questions or other cases that, that came up? Had some big cases about immigration that I haven't had a chance to talk to. One was called Biden versus Texas. I think you can probably guess what sides the different people were on in that one. Uh, there was a big case from Oklahoma about uh, law enforcement and federal versus, uh, or state versus tribal rights. Uh, came up, seemed to be a big reversal, made Gorsuch really cranky because they basically chucked the decision he'd written two years before and that tends to make justices mad. Um, any questions? Who has a question for me? Don't go at once. Yes, sir. Or yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes. It's hard to tell with the masks on. There's a case coming up in the next term, or this term, but I think it's like the Indian Child Welfare Act. Yes, there is. Uh, that's a case, the question was, there's a case uh, the court will be hearing later this term concerning the Indian Child Welfare Act. And this was an act passed largely about adoptions. That there have been a lot of fear, as there have been fear in various communities, too many of our children are being adopted by people outside of our community. And so the law made it more difficult for non-Indians to adopt Indian children. And there is a group of parents who are seeking to adopt children who are arguing this is a 14th Amendment due process violation 
you're setting up some groups as being more able to adopt children than we are. Uh, so that's the basis of that case. It, it hasn't been talked about a lot, but that is coming up. We just had a very large case about adoptions come out of Philadelphia two years ago uh, in which Catholic Social Services said, we are not going to work with adoptions with same-sex couples. It goes against our religion. Again, much like the Bay cake, hey, if you're a same-sex couple, here's a list of what we'd be happy to help steer you to somebody who will help you, but we're not going to do it. And they ruled in favor of the city of Philadelphia, in part on the argument that there was a shortage of adoptive parents. And making it harder for any one group to adopt people was going to serve potential adoptees badly. The logic of that for the Indian Claims case might be to argue that we should open things up more broadly about Indian adoptions. But uh, I haven't really read a lot of analysis about it, but that is another important case about Indians. The cases from Oklahoma have been the ones that have gotten the most attention uh, about Indians in recent years. Other questions? Thank you for that. Other cases about the EPA and uh, water and whether they can regulate wetlands that are temporary. Like you'd all know about vernal pools and things like that living in Maine. Sometimes there's water, other times of year there isn't. And some groups are arguing the EPA should only be allowed to regulate water where it's there all the time and they shouldn't be allowed to regulate places that run dry. And you put, well, there is water there a lot of the year. I think we kind of need to make sure when the water comes back, it's good. Yes, Frank. Yeah, first of all, I wanted to compliment you on um, accurately describing Roe v. Wade and Blackman's connection with the medical establishment and mm -hmm. what that case said and what's often said that it said versus what it actually said, which was that it was a real client for the medical establishment. It absolutely was, and nobody says that. Yeah. Because both sides regarded it as either this horrible thing that crushes the unborn or it's a vindication of the rights of women to control their own bodies. And Blackman wasn't really trying to do either of those things. As a matter of fact, I mean, the, um, the plaintiffs, I mean, Jane Rose specifically asked for the right to choose, you know, a, 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 an autonomy based decision. Right. And they didn't get it. I mean, no, they got not it, at all. The physicians right to make the medical decision in, in consultation with their client or patient within a certain, you know, trimester framework. It's a very different case than it is often portrayed. And it was a much more moderate decision in a lot of ways than... Relatively speaking, it, it didn't result in a huge outcry at the time. You know, people responded to it, but not nearly Considering 46 states, as you said, were overruled, it really didn't have that massive. I remember well, because I was 1973, I remember the case, and it wasn't that. I was alive, but I was 10, so I wasn't really analyzing the merits briefs quite as much as I might have otherwise. So, well, I think that's true. Well, part of what happens is the Catholic Church comes out against it right away. And a lot of the motivation comes from the alliance of conservative Catholics and conservative Christians that we see in the Reagan years of moving the Republican Party in a more socially conservative direction that moved it in, in, into, into those. And it's an issue where people talk past each other. They, you know, one side says, well, this is all about fetal personhood and it's about the fetus has a heartbeat, you shouldn't do that. And other people are defining this entirely in terms of bodily autonomy. And it becomes really, really hard to get to yes on that. I don't think it's as badly written a decision as most people think. I do think Ginsburg was right when she said it might have been better off for abortion rights in the long run if it hadn't been ruled on. That her argument was states were moving in a direction of legalizing abortion at that point. And that kind of put the hammer on allowing that continued evolution and made a lot of conservatives feel like, hey, this got hijacked from us. This got pulled out. The court shouldn't have the authority to do that. So I think acting when it was surprising, I think it might not have seemed controversial at the time, but I think the seeds for it to get to be controversial were all planted deep into the ground and were fertilized with miracle grow for them to all grow up and, and grow it up at a later time. Yes, sir. Well, you put your hand up, I thought. Oh, I'm seeing things. Jamie, uh, speaking of distinguished awesome alumni. Uh, thank you. Uh, oh, wait a minute, I thought I called on Dylan. No, I'm going uh, to. Oh, right. 
Jeez, and you go ahead. Um, I'm wondering if you could point to like another period in history where we've seen like such an activist for and like the subsequent impact on elections. Like I really feel mm-hmm. like you said it earlier that these cases and the real like conservative leaning you know opinions that have been written like it could impact our future, you know, this midterm season, next presidential year. Is that there? Yeah. The one, not on as big of a scale, but what I would point to would be the early 1960s. When you have the Warren Court, is the one period in American history we have had a consistently liberal activist court on rights of people accused of crimes, on civil rights, on a number of things. But what a lot of people forget is they were very activist about stepping into state legislatures and saying, your legislatures aren't apportioned right. You need to practice one person, one vote. Well, they said one man, one vote then, but they changed that. Right. So they step in very aggressively and make a lot of states very angry, and not all just in the South. It was largely a rural versus urban distinction. The states had tended to preserve a lot of representation by, like, not changing the legislative seats in 40 years, and the cities and suburbs were getting underrepresented. So it wasn't as partisan. But it certainly was as big a step into state politics as what we're seeing now, but much more about state politics. I can't think of a period where national level politics has been affected as much. But I think that's a very underrated um, importance of the Warren court, that they really changed the whole, you know, the commitment to one person, one vote really was not something they did, and the current court has moved away from that and saying we will not take partisan gerrymandering, won't do that. That's a fantastic question. You must have had a good professor for civil liberties. All right. <laughs> All right. I got time for maybe two more questions. Anyone else? Yes. Do you think that the justices, and then you can get the last one. Do you think the justices deliberate in good faith over these things? Do they listen to each other and consider opposing sides, or do they just walk in and say, I don't have a vote on this one. <laughs> well, we don't know because the Supreme Court is about the most secretive organization not called the CIA or NSA in American government. We don't have a lot of windows about that. When they go, when they testify, say, oh, well, Clarence Thomas said, I haven't really thought about Roe versus Wade. I'm not really sure. Seriously, dude. I'm sure he already had a pretty good idea. And they certainly go in with their biases, but certainly things like the scope of a ruling, how far it's going to go, how are we going to apply this in the future, I think they do very much listen to each other, and once in a while it changes the outcome. And the classic example is 2012, when the Supreme Court was debating Obamacare. That most people believe, reading Roberts' majority opinion, was that Roberts was going to side with Scalia and the others who wanted to declare Obamacare unconstitutional. And Roberts read Scalia's arguments and said, this goes too far. I'm not going to swallow this. I'm going so far not to swallow this, I'm going all the way to the other side. And his was the deciding vote. It made it, instead of a 5-4 ruling to wipe out the Affordable Care Act, it went the other direction. But is that what usually happens? I don't think it does, especially in a court that's divided six to three on a lot of things. I think we usually know what's going to happen. But those questions of scope are really important. You know, look, Roberts wanted to say Mississippi's law was valid, but in a totally different way than Alito did. And I think those kind of discussions are impactful, that they do listen and they like that back and forth. But a lot of the time, I think we're we're pretty sure who's going to say. But that Obamacare case couldn't have happened if they hadn't been reading each other's things because they take a preliminary vote but then they only cast the final vote once they've read the opinions. And that's what Roberts said. looked at this and said, seriously, I, I, I can't sign off on that. It's like reading a car contract and you see something like, you must offer a baby goat to the car dealer every, th- well, well, wait a minute, I didn't agree to do that. And so once in a while it, it does come up, but I would say most of the time they've got a pretty good idea what they want to do. Sir, you get the last question. Good, great questions everybody, nice job. Yeah, I was just hoping you could go into more detail about the tribal lands case. Yeah. About the adoptions case, or? The, yes. Okay, well that hasn't been ruled on yet, so we don't see too much about the arguments. 
but it's essentially a 14th Amendment equal protection clause argument that the families, I believe there are families in Texas that sought to adopt Indian children and weren't able to, and I haven't spent as much time with that case as uh, some of the other ones, but it's something where the current Supreme Court might do that. In the Oklahoma case uh, that we just got done with, they certainly sided against tribal interests uh, and essentially reversed themselves. Uh, Oklahoma has a large section of land that is considered native territory, roughly the eastern third of Oklahoma, and how are you going to apply the law in those places? So given that the Supreme Court was willing to rule against tribal interests, in that case, I'd say it's likely they would. But I'd have to be honest with you, that's not a case I've spent a lot of time examining. Uh, but it's certainly one that's, uh, that's going to come up. What's really interesting with the Indian Child Welfare Act is to, which is a lot of question, is to read the congressional debate that took place. It was actually aimed more or less at the Mormon Church really? because they had adopted 30,000 Navajo uh, children. And, and so that was the impetus. The question was, what's more important, standard of living, you know, in terms of you know, income, quality of schools, you know, yada, yada, you know, things that money buys, right? Or the uh, you know, tribal traditions, culture, language, and so on. And it's a fascinating debate because the, the uh, Members of Congress really got into it deeply. I think this is going to be kind of a replay of that. In the case of a fascinating debate indeed. And all of these, and many cases I didn't get to, like Biden versus Texas and the, Mil the Milliken case that was argued yesterday about Alabama, are all fascinating cases. But unfortunately, I have used up the balance of my time. Thank you so much for coming today. We'll be doing the same thing next year.